The Professors is brought to you by Blackborder.com. Blackborder.com is now $5 cheaper to get a booster box from than Star City Games with pre-sales of New Phyrexia for $84.99. So check out Blackborder.com for top pros who put out articles every week in low-priced cards and boxes today. Hello everybody and welcome to yet another episode of The Professors. Today we'll be taking a look at the full spoiler of New Phyrexia, yes, all 175 cards which were leaked last week. Of course, we'll also be talking about Jace the Banhammer Sculptor, what happened to decks playing him and not playing him in National Qualifiers and the Boston Open, and maybe how players will be beating him a month from now. So let's draw. How much does cost to matter in Magic? Well, three weeks ago we came to the conclusion that Legacy was too expensive. Wizards in the community agreed that the problem with the format was not that there weren't enough cheap decks to play that could be built for less than, say, $500, but rather that there was the existence of decks that far surpassed the payout of the top 8 at even a large tournament like a Star City Games Legacy Open. LSV said that he wouldn't want to play a format in which he knew that his opponent couldn't afford the cards he wanted to play. As a result, we proposed a new format to be used for, say, Star City Games Opens on Sundays, and according to viewers who were willing to test this format, we had actually found a great alternative to Legacy that wasn't as cost prohibitive as Legacy. However, it was soon pointed out that Legacy wasn't as problematic as the current standard format, because while Legacy has expensive cards that you could use to get a top 8, it does not have cards that you need to use to get a top 8. Sure, the cost threshold of top Legacy decks is a problem, but as many dissenters of this side of the argument pointed out, this problem is nothing in comparison to the standard format which currently requires you to have $360 in Jaces to begin your deck list. Now, I know you've probably heard all the facets of the ban Jace argument. Personally, over the last two weeks, I've read every article, listened to every podcast, and watched every video concerning the matter, and of the over 100 opinions all established before the leak of the entire new Phyrexia set, the general consensus was that Jace, the way it is now, is bad for the game. However, most raiders were willing to keep an open mind about Wizards not banning Jace until they see the metagame shift of New Phyrexia. Wizards claimed in the Twitter storm discussion and flurry of hashtag ban Jace tweets that Jace would not be emergency banned, and that if he was banned, it would be on June 21st, when the normal bannings happened, to which the writing community responded skeptically. Evan Irwin cited an article explaining why Skull Clamp and later the rest of the cards in Affinity, such as Disciple of the Vault and Arkbound Ravager, were banned, and that was because they were everywhere. However, Blackboarder's Jeremy Neiman pointed out that even decks like those featuring Skull Clamp, an obviously broken card, weren't as successful as Jace and never had 32 copies of itself in a Grand Prix Top 8. Also, Skull Clamp was a unique card that what it did could in no way be replicated in an aggro deck and the card advantage it granted was incomparable. The same could be said for Jace, but this is only half true really, as even without the Mind Sculptor, we'd still see decks in standard that jammed Gideon Jura, Jace Bellerin, Elspeth Terrell, and Venser the Sojourner into a deck to make a Planeswalker Confederation deck that's basically Callblade with a different draw method. This reveals the parallel of Callblade as a complete deck to Affinity, which eventually had to have three of its own component cards banned. This reveals that, hmm, is it possible that even if we do ban Jace the Wallet Sculptor, the Callblade deck will still be the best deck? To which I'd answer, yes, this is the case, and thus, there's no easy solution to beating Callblade. Jeremy Neiman also pointed out that Skull Clamp did have a silver bullet in the form of Damping Matrix, but that the card was dead against the remainder of the decks that weren't playing Skull Clamp. This brings up an interesting concept that Wizards has already attested is, in fact, the answer to the Jace problem is, we need a silver bullet just for Planeswalkers? Well, the new Phyrexia spoiler reveals six potential silver bullets for Planeswalkers or permanents in general. However, like the damping matrix scenario, early testing of standard with the entirety of new Phyrexia reveals that these cards can kill Jace, but the decks playing these cards with Jace are still more potent than those without him. You should not be able to add 5 Islands and 4 Jace the Mind Sculptor to a 60 card deck and have it be a better version than the original. But time and time again in testing, that's basically what we did to make a better deck. Hopefully Wizards will realize this and ban Jace on June 21st after New Phyrexia's release. Sure, Wizards tried to shoot the Raging Werewolf with a Silver Bullet, but all they really did was find out that the Werewolf was actually a machine capable of taking on a weaker looking being and firing this bullet right back at the shooter.
Unfortunately for the guy who leaked the entire set, he'll be going to jail for breaking a non-disclosure agreement, and unfortunately for sites that depend on spoiler season traffic to keep their page view count up, they probably won't be getting that same traffic. But fortunately for us, it means developing the metagame for post New Phyrexia standard three weeks before the set's released. Now, everyone has already started putting stuff like probes and Sword of War and Peace into their Callblade decks, but those who play on Magic League and are used to heavy testing on Magic Workstation are finding that the Esper version of Callblade is also a top contender. Unfortunately, it appears that decks without Jace still stand very little of a chance against the Planeswalker even with combinations of the Silver Bullets, which is because in decks dedicating so many slots to Hex Parasites, Beasts Within, and Less So Despise, the deck falters to deal with Callblade or Blue Black's other major threats, like huge creatures that you can't wait to use your discard on that are often drawn into or just more Planeswalkers the deck can't deal with. This is a sample non-Jace list that worked pretty well against Callblade in testing, but still folded to a sticking $100 bill. We arrived at this list after essentially combining a mono black deck that I expected to do well against the post New Phyrexia Callblade, but did not, and essentially Callblade. Now, I'm just showing this deck because it's a little easier to a certain non-blue decks in this format because, well, building blue decks is becoming an exact science with options like Gitaxian probes and equipments causing great variation in lists and resulting in us not being able to present a final list, though I hope to show you guys one with tournament winning results from a site like Magic League next week. This deck, however, turned out to have just the right answers to Callblade and enough card advantage with Mystics, Hawks, and Sign and Bloods, as well as the equipments making all your creatures into 2 for 1s and 3 for 1s. Vampire Nighthawk and Gatekeeper of Malakir were already good enough creatures to be slotted into the right black decks, and it turns out that this deck could not only slot them in, but pump them up with equipment. The discard package of Inquisition and Despise, as well as the 4 sideboardable Duress, are the preventative solution to pretty much everything in the format and are just as good if not better than the Go for the Throats and Doom Blades. One of the biggest advantages of this list compared to the mono black version is, while the mono black deck has maniacal control over the board and your opponent's hand with the same discard suite, Phyrexian Obliterator, and Scream Whip alongside Batter Skull, stopping an Obliterator could only be done by Callblade with a Mana Leak or Condemn, and it doesn't really need to be when it comes out and starts doing damage so late. Also, the raw power of Mono Black is diluted when the inconsistency of the discard and equipment packages are in your opening hand instead of creatures to attack with, which Squadron Hawk provides for. But anyway, the Black White list is pretty much just a food for thought build that will hopefully evolve until it hits the Star City open circuit and it's still no Callblade. Onto the spoilers, we'll start with the six potential silver bullets for Jace. The obvious ones for non Callblade decks are Beast Within and Artillerize. Beast Within is an obvious destructive force that lets Mono Green actually have better removal than Mold Chambler and a more direct way of dealing with big creatures than just sitting there with Acidic Slime. This is a better Pognify, and even if it grants your opponents the ability to put swords on top of their beast, the card is versatile and exceptional enough that, as an instant, lets you get around the beast being used to their full advantage. Artillerize, on the other hand, can't always be used to kill a Jace, and is probably too high of a mana cost, and is too clumsy to be used in non-big red decks that don't pack artillery like Pilgrim's Eye, but as an instant is an infinitesimally better Lava Axe that is versatile enough to see play. The three expected silver bullets that Jace decks might be slotting in are Surgical Extraction, Despise, and Hex Parasite. Now, the card disadvantage of the Parasite when facing anything that isn't a Planeswalker is becoming clear in Callblade Mirror Matches and Boarding Planeswalker from the deck in response to other decks boarding in Parasites. Surgical Extraction has the same limitation that doesn't do enough to kill a deck with the exception of Valakut, which this deck will actually have Extraction played against it. Despise, which is the most diverse option to take care of Planeswalkers, will no doubt see main deck play in Esper Colored Callblade, probably replacing Inquisition of Kozilek to take care of all the same cards with the exception of Mana Leak, which would target the discard spell either way to save your Planeswalker, and a sword that a Stoneforge Mystic would dig up another copy of anyway. Interestingly, this is also the first card that lets you directly target Planeswalkers. Now, the fringe silver bullets that take care of Planeswalkers are Corrupted Resolve and Sword of War and Peace's red ability. Now, we'll get to the actual usability of the Resolve in the blue-black infect deck next, but Sword of War and Peace is the clear tier 1 choice to knock out your opponent's Planeswalkers or double the amount of damage your 3-3 Hawks deal and end the game before it turns into a Planeswalker War. 
Oddly, the sword teamed with Feast and Famine, resulting in both you and your opponent having less cards in your hand, doesn't work too well, but Pro Red, Pro White, and these abilities on the sword mean it will already be played over every sword of body and mind. Now, as for Corrupted Resolve and the potential Infect cards of the format, we're now seeing that the Infect deck will see Constructed play. Now, whether this will be by way of something like Triumph of the Hordes becoming an end the game spell alongside a horde of creatures or in a blue black infect deck, I'm not sure, though I'm betting on a blue black infect, as diluting your damage in a mono green stompy deck between infect and regular damage doesn't seem good enough to force through winning damage, that is, unless the mono green deck has some assistance from Overwhelming Stampede as an alternate win condition, Beast Within as good removal, Garrick, and low casting cost, strong creatures like Leatherback Bailoth to force damage through, which is an interesting concept. However, there is one card in the mono green deck that will be easily slotted in to stomp through, but has been wildly overlooked. Mere Superion, from a limited standpoint, probably seems terrible as its tribe suggests that you'll have to put together a motley, unplayable mana base that includes picking, like, five mirrors and a mere galvanizer over good cards in the scar pack of that draft. However, in Constructed, Mirror Superion already has Llanowar Elves, Overgrown Battlements, Lotus Cobra, Elvish Archdruid, and most importantly, Draga Tree Speaker to power out a 5-6 for 2 on turn 2 or 3 to ensure a giant creature winning the game for you before the other side can do anything like get a Titan into play. Also, this deck would run Lead the Stampede to let you draw 2 or 3 cards and dig up the creatures in your deck to dominate the early game before Callblade can make a dent on your life total. Here's the list we reached that happened to beat out Callblade most of the time, though didn't like Triumph of the Hordes because of its resulting dilution of Infect and regular damage. Now, the sideboard is mostly speculative, and constructing it was pretty weird. Presumably, Four Autumn's Veil is a blatantly wrong choice, but when being played against Callblade and the Black decks, we had some pretty next-level plays that let our creatures win the game or let me accelerate to Gaia's Revenge, which seems to be an overlooked card that pretty much wins the game by itself when it lands in this deck, and it does with 15 accelerants and lead the stampedes to find them. Now, as for the blue-black infect deck, I haven't been able to crunch out a solid record with it, especially against Callblade, but initially these are all the Infect cards that I thought might be put into a good aggro or mid-range deck. Of course, because of the color and cost restrictions, we come down to these. Now, it would appear that these three Infect creatures clearly aren't enough to push the deck into being a Type 2 playable deck, but I'd argue that it isn't creatures that will push this deck into being playable, but rather the spells like Psychic Barrier that might make Bladed Agent playable alongside Distortion Strike in a blue-black infect deck, and a low mana, fast counterspell good enough to beat out Cawblade. Is the deck good enough? Well, I don't know, but Jace will probably be added to the deck to make it good enough to win tournaments. As for more good blue cards in the set, Mental Misstep might not be a huge mark in Standard, as there will be a whopping 7 largely played 1-drops in Standard after the set's release and countering them will be difficult and or irrelevant because the cards won't end the game, but in Legacy, this card is nuts. One-drops occupy nearly 40% of the format, and unlike Standard, the top seven one-drops in this format will end games. This is one of the most talked about cards in the set, and probably one of the most overly talked about cards in the set, but that's only because Legacy enthusiasts will not stop talking about this card and emphasizing how much the card will change the game in Legacy because over half the important combo pieces, draw spells, and attackers cost one mana. Will people change archetypes and stop playing one-drops to morph around mental missteps, massive, destructive force against decks where these one-drops are all important? Will Reality Spasm replace Candelabra of Thanos because High Tide can't slot in Mental Misstep? No, Mental Misstep will not single-handedly take out all of these one-drops, but it'll make a big change for the format and hopefully for the better when people can't afford the other cards like Candelabra of Thanos. However, a Phyrexian card like Dismember will replace Path to Exile and Swords to Plowshare in some decks because even without black mana and costing 4 life and a colorless to cast, this card will function to kill creatures in, say, mono blue decks that can afford the life but didn't have the form of creature kill prior. In standard, the card will function diversely in most decks, playing black and maybe live in a 
couple control sideboards to beat out big creatures like bane slayers and work in response to equipments of batter skulls and swords to hawks and stoneforge mystics this spell costing four life in a non-black deck though isn't for all decks and can't be slotted in against decks with lots of small creatures but can tezzeret's gambit be fit into more decks well in testing we found that the proliferate ability is rarely relevant and casting this card will most often be three colorless and two life because turn four might be too late to cast this card and turn four is also when you want to play jace so turn four draw two cards instead of do everything else is out of the question for callblade However, for red and green, perhaps a sign in blood for three has potential. Of course, the truth is that Batter Skull is just plain going to push aggro almost completely out of the metagame in a rug and Callblade, which will continue dominating the metagame, just watch. The card is already ridiculous enough as it gives you a 4-4 lifelink for two at instant speed off Stoneforge Mystic's effect, but worse than that, it has Vigilance and you can bounce it to your hand for three, and worst of all, it's Mythic. This is a card that clearly does not need to have a Mythic stamp as a rarity. I see the purpose of cards like Titans, Avenger of Zendikar, the Eldrazi, and even Jace as being mythic, because these cards have big epic effects and they flavorfully make sense in the game. However, Wizards stated two years ago that the mythics could not be tournament staples and thus probably not cost, say, $100. And yet, how does Wizards justify Vengevine being mythic? Lotus Cobra? Batter Skull? Anyway, it's economic cost in Callblade and maybe Black-White Control, if that deck can withstand Blue's work around cards like Jace and Manalik, will result in this card costing over $50 in Stoneforge Mystic as it becomes even more important, probably hiking to nearly 40 Right now, without knowledge of how the true metagame will roll out, sites like Star City Games are pre-selling Batter Skulls for 25 and Stoneforges for 30 However, as seen by the fact that Karn Liberated is still holding a value of $50, the general public is not aware of the dominant force of Callblade and how dominant variations of it will still be. And yet, soon enough, as more pre-orders come in, we're already seeing Mystics and Batter Skulls increase in price, on some sites both breaking $40. Lastly, in the list of metagame-worthy spoilers in the set today is Malira, Silvok Outcast. Now, while this doesn't appear to immediately turn off Infect because opposing creatures could still hate your life total, it essentially does because opposing infect creatures have been so dumbed down and their creatures now incredibly overcosted and their potential counter spells like Psychic Barrier now useless, that this card will truly shut down infect if it can be slotted into a green deck sideboard and if infect is really a relevant deck. However, this card also does some cool Johnny stuff like combo with etched monstrosity to get a 10-10 for 5. This card played with Unlife also means that you can't lose the game as you can't have poison counters placed on you, but whether this is enough to defeat the inevitable Callblade list is up for debate. Now, as for the inevitable post-New Phyrexia Callblade list that we've tested out over 100 games of and sustained a winning percentage against mainstream decks like the thoroughly tested ones we've showed you above, Rug, and slightly updated versions of Red Deck Wins, the list still maintains a win percentage of over 80%. Check out the list. This is the mark of a truly stale format, when the new best deck looks less than five cards different from the old best deck. Yep. That's it for this week. That's the deck, and that's probably the format. Until next week, when we hopefully find a real answer to Callblade, maybe a good combo deck or two, and the seemingly less playable cards in this set, this is Anthony Palmario. On behalf of the not-so-faithful-in-the-format professors, we're tapped out for now, but we'll untap soon. <laughs>